we've all seen the cartoons, the movies, whatever it is, with this picture, the angel and the devil on each shoulder, like whispering in your ears, trying to get you to do the good thing or the bad thing. That's not really true. You know that, right? Yes. But it's kind of true. You and I do have voices. I start the voices that we hear. Some of you do hear voices, but, <laughs> but we have, there are voices in our ears. There are always people that are suggesting to us what we should do. And many of them are unsolicited. Uh-huh. Like, I don't mind listening to somebody to ask, but some people are just always free with their advice. Um, and, always, and many of them are trying to not just give us advice, but to encourage us in a particular direction. Well, in 1 Kings chapter 13, we're going to find a man that has a number of voices in his ears instructing him or trying to influence him and what he should do. So 1 Kings chapter 13, the most important voice we can listen to is the voice of God. And so that's where we start. Uh, First 10 verses, we find some instructions from God. Look at what happens. Behold, a man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make offerings. And the man cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord. Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name. And he shall sacrifice on you the priest of the high places who make offerings on you. And human bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign that the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be torn down, and the ashes that are on it shall be poured out. And when the king heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against the altar at Bethel, Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Seize him. And his hand, which he stretched out against him, dried up, so he could not draw it back to himself. The altar also was torn down, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign that the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king said to the man of God, Entreat now the favor of the Lord your God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored to me. And the man of God entreated the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him and became as it was before. And the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. The man of God said to the king, If you give me half your house, I will not go in with you. And I will not eat bread or drink water in this place. For so was it commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall neither eat bread nor drink water nor return by the way that you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way that he came to Bethel. Now, it's interesting that he's called a man of God. The reason it's interesting is because in the Bible, the word man is used a number of different ways. In fact, the majority of the time, the word man is just can mean a person. Some modern translations actually translate it human being. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That just that is the person. But there are actual words for male and female in the Bible. There are no other words male and female. And the word that's used here is actually the word for a male, a a, a male of God. So this isn't like some office. This isn't a generic term. It means actually there's a male who's walking with God that God selects. The implication being that he could have picked a female, but he picked this guy. There's also something else that's interesting. Like he's not named. He's just not there. He's just this guy who has this one task that we read about in the Bible. In reality, the overwhelming majority of you, your name will be forgotten in history. But God will never forget how you have served him. That's right. And so that's this guy. God knows his name. God knows everything about him. So we have this man of God comes out of Judah, which is the southern kingdom, and he heads to the northern kingdom, so he's kind of a foreigner, and he goes to Bethel where they have this uh, altar that's been built by Jeroboam, and Jeroboam's standing by the altar to make offerings, which is against the rules. In the Old, it's really interesting in the Old Testament, you have all these different power groups, and the Old Testament is set up so that they are in conflict with one another. Why does the Old Testament set them up to where they're in conflict with one another? The reason is because when they're in conflict with one another, all power does not reside in the hands of an individual. Because that's a good thing if we have a good individual, but I haven't known enough of those. And so there is, there's a, 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 a balance of powers, so to speak. And so the priests have responsibilities, the prophets have responsibilities, the elders have responsibilities, the king has responsibilities. But here the king is doing what belongs to the priests. So he's trying to take more power to himself. He's standing here on the altar, by the altar, to make offerings. And 
the man cries against the altar by the word of the Lord. He says, altar, altar. It's interesting that he's saying it to the altar, not to anybody, but to the altar. He says to the altar, here's what's going to happen. In the future, a descendant of David is going to be born. It's going to be someone who's going to be king, obviously, of Judah, who's going to reign in Jerusalem. Josiah by name. Now, this is about 300 years later before it happens. You can read about it in 2 Kings 22 and 23, the whole life and career of Josiah. I've always found it interesting over the years, one of our sons, we named him Josiah because of this great king. How many people, when even I've even had pastors, Josiah, what? where'd you get that name? <laughs> um, and uh, he's, it's interesting. He is a lesser known king who's irrelevant to the world. He's never mentioned anywhere outside the Bible. And yet we have more about his reign than almost any other king outside of Saul, David, or Solomon. Because Josiah is a man who walked with God and served God. And so this prophet predicts that 300 years from now, there's going to be a king named Josiah who's going to sacrifice on these high places, these priests who are not Levites, who have been pulled up from the people, he's going to, to offer human bones on there. So he makes this prediction. Well, I don't know about you, but I'll be honest. A 300 years from now prediction is completely irrelevant to me. Uh-huh. Some of you may think you're going to live that long, but at some point you'll realize it's irrelevant to you. Right. I, it's funny, interesting. People say, man, I've never met any of these Jesus is coming again soon, people who think that Jesus is coming in the year 2,374. It's always in my lifetime. Have you ever noticed that? Nobody ever writes the book, Jesus is coming long after you're dead. That book's not going to sell very well at all. And so, he says, so this 300-year prediction, you know, everybody around thinking, yeah, right, whatever. He says, but here's how you know that it's true. Because in your lifetime, this altar is going to be turned, burned down and the ashes are going to be poured out on the ground, which was, again, a violation because all the ashes were supposed to be put into a holy place because they've been given on an altar. So he says, this is the sign. Uh, it's going to be torn down. And so, look what the king does. I'm telling you, God's word always has an impact on people. And it does here. So when the king heard what the man said, he repents. No, he does not. He stretched out his hand from the altar saying, seize him. Now, just so you'll know, commentaries on the Bible, guys who write commentaries, are given by the editor a certain number of pages. You get get 300 pages to write a commentary on 1 Kings. So here's what commentators will do. The really difficult, complicated passages that everybody struggles with, they sort of gloss over those. And then they get to one of these and they write 18 pages. It's like, look, I can hit my 300-page limit and I don't have to say anything. I've got a whole office full of these kind of commentaries. So he stretched out his hand and it stuck, has gotten a lot of ink. Because let's face it, that really is the most important thing to figure out exactly what happened. Some of them like his hand stuck with his finger pointed like this. I mean, can you imagine going around like, like this? Just hold your hand out like this. Just imagine how awful that would be to go through life like this. Quit pointing at me. Can you imagine eating? Is there something you want, sir, at the restaurant? No, I'm okay. You would always want to sit in the booth on the side where your right is out. Or if he's left-handed on the side, where his left hand's out. Because if there's somebody here next to you, this could become very irritating. Can you imagine driving in the car? I mean, just think about what, so that's my favorite interpretation, by the way, because I just find that quite humorous. I can, because I'm a visual learner, I just picture this. And some of you today are just going to start walking around the house like this, just to irritate the people who live with you. And when they ask, what are you doing? saying, I'm being biblical. And so his hand, other people think his hand shrivels up and that he, he can't use it. And so it's like some kind of stroke or palsy or something that's kind of pulled his hand up. And others think his hand is up straight up in the air. And, and uh, some of them think that, that, that he can't move it at all. Like he can't even go like this. It's just stuck in one position. Um, and so there are a variety of ideas to, to what it is. But to me, it's not really that important. The point is, it's not good. His response to God's word is not good, and now he has a, a punishment from God for what he has done. Um, and I'm guessing that his hand didn't stick till after he said, seize him. So he can't draw it back. So verse 5 tells us that the sign that was given happens. The altar's torn down. So now they know that the word of the prophet's going to come true. So verse 6 is very, very significant and important. 
The king said to the man of God, Entreat now the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. Is there anything wrong with this prayer? There's everything wrong with this prayer. What's the real problem with Jeroboam? It's not an arm that's stuck out here. It's heart's not right with God. What he really should have done was repent. But instead, Jeroboam does what all of us do. Gets selfish in his prayer. Now, one or two of you super holy people are probably going to email me. And tell me I don't ever pray for myself. Yeah, we know better. I mean, this is just, and so it, just, it is a very selfish prayer. It doesn't say pray for the people. It doesn't pray, I, I, I confess my sin. I, it doesn't do any of that. All it says is, look, can you ask God to give me my hand back? And so the man of God entreated the Lord. Now, the Bible usually doesn't tell us how much time passes. It just tells us this happened and that happened. So we don't know how much time it's going to be. I just wonder how long the, the guy stood there and didn't say anything. But just let Jeroboam kind of wallow for a minute before he prayed. I don't know. If he, would, if, he, if he spoke the language of sarcasm, we know that he just stood there for a while. And just let Jeroboam think about it. Or maybe pray to me. I don't know. We don't have much time passed. But he prays and the king's hand is restored to him as it was before. So we have a miracle. We have a punishment, and now we have a miracle. Now he can, and I don't know if he's like, I'm, I just, again, because I, my brain doesn't work like most people's, I just kind of have this, I start to ask questions. Like, in the future, did he point like this? So that if it happened again, he wouldn't be like this? Kind of, you know, like, like, did he, I mean, did he ever like really stretch out his hands again? Do you think, I don't want to go through life like this? And so I don't know. I, I, it doesn't tell, I just, it, it, I know it's really, the wires don't touch or they do or they're not supposed to or something. But he, and so now look what he says. He says, man, I'm going to pay you. Watch what's happened. He's gone from seize him to come have dinner with me. Because this man has prayed for him. He's been healed. He may, maybe he can pray for something else, wealth or peace or prosperity or victory in battle or something. He says, come home with me and, and I will give you a reward. I'll, I'll pay you for this. And the man of God says to the king, nope. I don't do this for money. I do it because this is what God has called me to do. I do this in an act of service to the Lord. I will not go with you. I will not eat bread. I will not drink water because God commanded me not to do that and told me to go a different way. So he goes a different way. He, he returns. In other words, what we find here is Jeroboam has not listened to the voice of God. He has not repented even when all this happened. Now, all he thinks of God is maybe God can help me out of a jam versus the man of God who's been obedient to the voice of God. God is speaking to us all the time. Yes. The problem is most of us don't listen. We don't want to hear the small, still voice. We don't want to get into His Word and, and pray. And so we have the, the, the voice of God speaking, and one guy's obedient, and Jeroboam never gets it right. Now let me just say a little bit here about the punishment that comes on Jeroboam. Oftentimes in the Bible, God punishes, or I like the word discipline because punishment kind of sounds like it's final and there's nothing can be done after that. But God oftentimes disciplines to bring about repentance on our behalf. Yes. It doesn't work, you think it would work with Jeroboam. And it semi-works with some people. Something bad happens and, and, and they'll straighten up for a little bit and then they go back to their ways again. So then, but, but the idea is that it would bring about repentance. But there's also something else that's interesting. God's discipline in the Bible is never given on the nations. His final punishment is given. His judgment comes. But God does not discipline the nations. God's discipline in the Bible is for His people. And when His discipline comes, it should cause His people to repent. Now, let me tell you why this is so significant. Every time something bad happens whether it's a virus or it's an attack or a terrorist something or other, every time something bad happens, I hear a lot of people say, well, maybe our nation will turn back to God. That is never the purpose of God's discipline. It is our churches will turn back to God. Yes. His people will turn back to Him. Mm -hmm. the, the call, listen, you know what we should expect out of non-believers? Behavior of non-believers. Do you know why? Because they're non-believers. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the call is not, you can't return to a place you never were. 
And people who aren't walking with God can't return because they've never walked with God. The, the call to repent is for you and me to walk closer to God, to, to get some of the trash out of our lives. The problem in nations is not when lost people act like lost people, it's when Christians act like lost people. We should bring our lives into line in accordance with what God has said. And so, unfortunately, Jeroboam has heard the voice of God, but he does not obey. He does not repent when God's discipline comes on him. Now, I wish we could just have these two guys, the prophet and the king, and one guy listens to the voice of God, one does not. But unfortunately, this prophet, he's going to listen to what many of us have all the time. Actually, all of us have all the time. And that is false voices. Look at verse 11. Now, an old prophet lived in Bethel. I'm glad the Bible doesn't define old. I don't know how old you have to be to be old. I know that last year there were a handful of places that began to give me a discount because they think I'm old because I hit 55. Other places don't think I'm old till 60. Some people don't think I'm old till I'm 65 or 67 and a half. And some people think I've been old since 30. I don't know. I don't know what old is, but let's just assume this dude is not in his 20s or 30s. Matter of fact, when, that the more years I accumulate, the older old gets. Exactly. So we don't know, but he's been a prophet a long time. So let's say he's 103. That'll, that makes, a, no matter what age you are, hopefully that'll make you at least feel better. So he's an old prophet, been at this a long time. He lived in this town of Bethel. And his sons came and told him all that the man of God had done done that day in Bethel. They also told to their father the words that he had spoken to the king. And their father said to them, which way did he go? And his son showed him the way that the man of God who came from Judah had gone. And he said to his son, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him and he mounted it. Now I don't know if a donkey's gonna go faster than on foot, but I'm thinking if you're old prophet, maybe you can't walk very well or not at all. That's why his sons had to report. So, and back then they didn't have knee replacements and hip replacements and cortisone or all the other things that we take. And so he gets, they sadly gets on him. Verse 14, he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. Now, why is he sitting under an oak? Because he lived in the desert. It's the afternoon. And what do you do when it's hot and sunny outside? Shade. You find shade. We all know what this is like. And this is like a real tree. This isn't like one of those little spriggly bush things that you park the corner of your car underneath. This is like for, like for real. This is a big mass of trees finding shade. And he said to him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. They said to him, come home with me and eat bread. He said, I may not return with you or go in with you. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, you shall neither eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by the way that you came. And now verse 18 is the key verse. And he said to him, I also am a prophet as you are. We went to the same Bible college. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, bring him back with you into your house that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. See, I don't have to tell you this is a lie. The Bible tells us. He just lied to him. It's frightening to think that a preacher would intentionally lie. I'd hope you'd say amen right here. I mean, it's, it's, it's so he lied to him. So what does this prophet from Judah do? He went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. Now, this prophet should have known God does not change his mind. God doesn't say, well, go to this. No, not change my mind. Let's go do something else. It's not like that. He should have known and continued to be obedient to God's voice. But now he has this false voice in his ear. So, Verse 20 and 21 are really interesting. And as they sat at the table, the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried to the man of God who came from Judah, thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the command that the Lord your God commanded you, but have come back and eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which he said to you, eat no bread and drink no water. Your body shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. Now let's just get the picture, Okay. Brother Kevin's on a mission from God. Okay, some of you have seen the Blues Brothers. So Brother Kevin's on a mission from God. And God says, don't eat, don't drink, nothing. 
So I come, and I was lied to him. I was lying. I said, man, an angel told me you're supposed to come to my house, and we're going to suck the heads on some crawfish. Because you're going to tempt, let's just go for real tempt. Yeah. And so Brother Kevin comes to my house, and we come in, and we sit down, and here's the food spread out. And then I look across the table at him and I go, you reprobate, you've been disobedient to God, you're going to die. That's what God says. Now, what in the world do you think Brother Kevin's going to think about me? This guy is nuts. Like he told me two verses earlier in the Bible, God said, come home with me. Now he's telling me God's going to kill me. Here's what I want you to note that to me is fascinating. God used this lying prophet. Understand God can and does use anyone because if God only uses holy vessels, there's nobody around for God to use. So the Bible says, you know, we're broken vessels and we're dirty vessels and, and, you know, and and we're praying that God makes us cleaner, but God uses us with all of our faults. Here's the other thing I want you, that I found fascinating throughout my life is when I listen to people tell about how they became Christians, some of them, this is what they'll say. Well, I was listening to this pastor And God just spoke to me, convicted me of my sin. He called me and I put my faith in Jesus. I'm thinking, that pastor is a heretic. That pastor doesn't tell the truth. But God can still use them. My own brother's one of them. They were listening to a preacher one night on TV who was disgraced multiple times. And my brother started asking questions of my dad. My dad lamed the Lord right there in the living room. Because you know what? God made a donkey talk in numbers. Trust me, he can get his message across from some knothead preacher or anyone else for that matter. So God uses this old prophet to tell him that he's going to die. And then verse 23, I find this stunning. After he had eaten bread, now the prophet would have done this. I said, mm, I'm not going to eat. I'm going to go back to my original. But he goes ahead and apparently and eats. After he'd eaten bread and drunk, he saddled the donkey for the prophet whom he had brought back. And as he went away, a lion met him. This is the, the prophet from uh, Judah. Met him on the road and killed him. That's a horrible way to die. Matter of fact, can I just be honest with you? I don't know a lot of ways that aren't horrible ways to die. I mean, some are probably less horrible than others. I prefer Jesus comes back and I miss that whole thing. But if I die, I'd like to preach about how great Jesus is and go home and lay down for a Sunday afternoon nap and wake up up in heaven. I mean, that's, but anyway, so he gets shredded by this lion or killed by him. And his body was thrown in the road by the lion, apparently. And the donkey stood beside it. The lion also stood beside the body. Now, y'all know that a lion ain't going to sit there. That donkey is dessert. But this is from God. And so God, you know, he shut the mouths of lions for Daniel. And now he's going to make this lion and his donkey stand here together. And behold, men passed by and saw the body thrown the road and the lion standing by the body. I'm going to assume they gave a lot of distance. Probably more than six feet. Well, they went by this lion standing by the body. And they came and told it in the city where the old prophet lived. And when the prophet who had brought him back from the way heard of it, he said, It is the man of God who disobeyed the word of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord has given him to the lion, which has torn him and killed him, according to the word that the Lord spoke to him. This prophet's just plumb messed up. Verse 27, And he said to his son, Saddle the donkey for me. And they saddled it, meaning his donkey, not the other one. And he went and found his body thrown in the road, and the donkey and the lion standing beside the body. The lion had not eaten the body or torn the donkey. They just killed him. He didn't eat. And the prophet took up the body of the man of God and laid it on the donkey and brought it back to the city to mourn and to bury him. He laid the body in his own grave, and they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. And after he had buried him, he said to his sons, When I die, bury me in the grave in which the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. I guess he wants to feel like maybe he did something right along the way. For the saying that he called out by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places there in the cities of Samaria shall surely come to pass. Now, this this old prophet in Bethel is a case study for us. But there are lots of voices. And we want to make sure we listen to the right voices. So, I did a Google search for the word sermons. Google came up with 67,100,000 sermons. I scrolled through the first few and I thought, okay, 
there were like two or three preachers that I really like and, and then one I don't care for. But I had to get a couple pages in before I started getting off into some of the kind of weird preachers. I thought maybe it's just based on my like search history because you know if you're on the computer they're tracking everything. And so I, I, I just went to our youth pastor Clisby and said hey could you do a Google search for sermons and the same names popped up. So it's like okay then these people obviously paid more than anybody else to get their names listed first. And I, I know how I mean I understand how all that works. But I just like jump down to page six and I start looking down through some of these sermons. I'm thinking you know when I hear preachers, it doesn't take me that long to categorize them as whether or not they're preaching something that's false or true. And then some are mostly true. They got maybe a few weird things, but not too bad. And then there's some that preach the truth, and I just don't care a lot for their delivery style, their personality. I mean, I, you know, what they say is fine, just their personality thing doesn't click with me. I get that. And then there's some that preach the truth that I really like. So, you know, I, I can listen for a few minutes. And all. But I'm thinking, what about somebody who doesn't know anything? They're not, they're not even a believer. And they decide they want to find a sermon. Well, I was glad that Tony Evans was the top name to pop up. Because he is one of my favorite preachers. And, and he's not going to lead them astray. So I was like, okay, that, that's, that's pretty good. Well, they scroll down three or four pages and get some of these whack jobs that were on there. Like page three had the Unitarian Universalist Church. That means that there is no Father, Son, and Spirit and everybody goes to heaven. I don't know why you believe anything if you believe nothing. But anyway, um, I'm like, man, what would that, there are a million voices out there. There are lots of books. You walk into books and go, I want a Christian book. If you don't know anything about the authors, who knows what you're going to find. You turn on Christian radio and... It may be okay or it may be just flat out wrong and misleading. Now, some of them don't tell the truth because they are also deceived. But some of them, they tell a lie anyway for their own personal profit. Like this guy did. You and I need to be careful because there are false voices everywhere. And it's not just preachers. Sometimes it's our own family members. Somebody we work with go to school with, somebody we share a hobby with. We need to beware. There are, there are, there's God's voice and there are false voices. And unfortunately, this man of God listened to God's voice, but then was misled by a deceptive voice. It can happen to anyone. We need to be on guard. And then the worst voices of all are the unrepentant voices, the defiant voices. Look at what happens in verse 33. After this thing, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way. After he saw all of this, and he witnessed all of this, he does not turn from his evil way. But made priests for the high places again from among all the people. Any wood he ordained to be priest of the high place, which is a violation of God's word. And this thing became sin to the house of Jeroboam, so as to cut it off and destroy it from the face of the earth. You know what? The, and there are lots of words in the Bible that are sad. I think the saddest words in the Bible are too late too late. But these words are also sad, did not turn. Has been exposed to the truth, but did not turn. The, the worst voice you can hear are those that live in defiance to God. Because those who are evil want to pull other people into their evil. So well, I just can't believe that. Of course you do. Don't you want to pull other people into walking with Jesus like you? Okay, maybe you don't care if they all burn in hell. Don't you want other people to come into the life that you have in Jesus Christ? So people who live in evil want other people to come into their life, which is evil. It shouldn't surprise us. If we, if we think our life is the one to have, we think other people ought to get in on that life. And so the, these defiant voices, notice what happens. It's not just Jeroboam who doesn't turn from evil, but it's the people who are not Levites who become priests. And then notice what it says in verse 34. How it becomes a sin to the house of Jeroboam. That the whole nation is going to follow the house of the king. That, 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 in other words, what he's saying is that God's punishment of them, in this case not discipline, but it's going to be actual punishment, is justified. That I'm, I'm just shocked at how many people give almost no thought to eternity. They'll think about their own mortality when they come to a funeral. 
or they have some health scare. But beyond that, they don't think about their own mortality and they don't think about eternity. I want to give you a voice of warning. There is an eternity. And it'll be an eternity separated from God, paying the price for your own disobedience to God forever because it requires an eternal punishment when you have sinned against an eternal God. Or it's going to be forever in a wonderful place called heaven, worshiping, glorifying, and celebrating His Son, Jesus Christ. But this is coming. And it just shocks me how many people don't listen, and yet it doesn't shock me. It's not just true of spiritual things. It's true of physical things. You all have all seen a bunch of these commercials. So I just went and pulled one so that we could take a look at it about warning people and yet how some are defiant. I would find never seen a cigarette in my entire life. I truly really do that with I never ever seen one. My flesh picks it up mountain. Now, this is not the anti-smoking sermon. But you all know the purpose of those commercials. We could do it for a hundred different things. It's just these are the ones that run on television all the time. So, sir, you've seen them. It's someone who is trying to be a voice of warning. And yet, there are many who don't heed that voice. There are many who don't listen. They, they just, they continue to live in defiance. But I'm telling you, if you live in defiance of what God has said... Someday you will suffer the consequences. Listen to what God has said. Be careful that you're not led astray by false voices. And certainly avoid those who are defiant voices. So let me see if I can help us kind of pull all this together about what we have here. This is a filter thingy. Uh, Open it. Microwave it eat it. That's about the extent of Paul Smith's kitchen abilities. Actually, I can wash dishes too. And and some of you are with me. You know exactly, you cook just like I do. Uh, Open and heat. But when you cook, you know, you use this thing to filter out stuff. Hey, some of you have no imagination. I don't know how in the world you ever get through life. You don't like Disney or anything. You have no imagination. So just kind of work with me here. Hey, so, we use it to, to filter stuff out, right? Right, y'all with me. Okay. All right, now here is the deal. Everybody, and I mean everybody, filters everything through something. Everybody filters everything through something. Some people filter it through their own comfort. Jeroboam, not I repent, make my hand better. Some people filter it through what will get me to the next fix. What will get me to the next hit. Some people filter it through what will make my parents angry. Some people filter it through what will get me more in this life. More money, more position, more prestige, more power, more fame. Some people filter it through what will make me more popular. You and I should filter everything through God's Word. This prophet has a lot of voices. You and I have a lot that comes in every day. We have a lot of information. You encounter more information in one day than most people in history encountered in their entire lifetime. We have a lot to filter through. Make sure you filter it through what God has said in His Word. This is called a worldview, and everybody has one. Everybody has a worldview. Most people, unfortunately, cannot clearly articulate what their worldview is, but they do have some view of the world, and they filter everything through it. Personally, I filter everything through God is holy, powerful, righteous, and just, has sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to pay the penalty for my guilt, rose again the third day to guarantee me that I will live with Him forever. I filter everything through that because that is the core message of God's Word. And so that, that's my worldview. I, I, I view everything through God is sovereignly in charge and he sent his son by his unbelievable grace for my life. And everything I do should be in glory and honor to this God and his son, Jesus Christ. 
That's, we filter. So everybody filters everything they encounter through that. This prophet did pretty good at first, but then he messed up. There's such a warning there for you and me. When I say filter through, I don't mean filter through today, Sunday, but tomorrow you can let it all go. Because you know what's going to happen tomorrow? You're still going to filter everything through something. Don't have a pantry full of filters and try to grab the one you think is best for the situation you're in. You take the right filter for everything and that is the truth of God's word. It is what God has said. We need to filter our lives through that. Everything we encounter, everything we believe, everything we see, everything we do, we filter all of it through the truth of God's word. Because you know what happens if we don't? We're going to be misled by a false voice. Or even worse, we're going to be destroyed by a defiant verse, a voice.